Well, good morning, uh, everyone, and may I welcome everyone to the 10th Public Petitions Committee meeting 2015. Uh, I would remind everyone to switch off mobile phones and electronic devices as they do interfere with the sound system. Uh, we don't have any apologies uh, for today's meeting. Uh, the first item of business today uh, is consideration uh, of... The first, sorry, the, 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 the uh, decision, uh, the first item of business seeks the committee's agreement to take agenda item four on external research in private. Does the committee agree to take this agenda item in private? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of three new petitions. The committee will hear from two of the petitioners. The first new petition is by is PE 1560 by John Boston on local authority planning, appeals procedure, members have a note by the clerk and a spice briefing, and the petition. Uh, can I welcome the petitioner, John Buxton, to the meeting? And uh, Mr Buxton, I believe that you want to say a few words before we move into questions. Yes, um, <clears throat> there's just one or two points I want to make. I sent um, some diagrams yesterday, um, and I believe you've all got copies. Um, what I've done on these three diagrams is set out the basics of the uh, case. Um, it, if you look at the first floor diagram, which is the uh, current one, sorry, the first one is my recommendation. <laughs> um, what I'm saying is that the council complaint procedure should be concluded and the uh, uh, an accurate um, report of handling should be corrected right at the start um, by the uh, planning authority before it goes to the ward councillors. Um, the ward councillors are involved. Um, it only becomes a decision by virtue of the fact that they don't call it in. So, in effect, they're taking a decision themselves before it moves on. So it, there's two paths that it can go to, and on my recommended, there's a correct local, uh, a correct ROH that goes right through the whole system. If, if you look at the second sheet, which is the current one, um, there's two procedures: the, the review procedure and there's a complaint procedure. Um, the complaint procedure stops at the uh, SPSO because the SPSO seed examination of the facts to the local review body. So you can see on the second one, it's corrected by the review procedure, which takes uh, place after the decision has been made. And the ROH have an inaccurate ROH, it, 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 if it is inaccurate. Um, if it's called in, it, it goes to the full council and it's inaccurate. Uh, but I would expect the Minister would correct it at the next stage. The third diagram is what actually happened in, in, in the, uh, uh, the plan application that I identified. Um, it was inaccurate all the way through because the local review body uh, didn't review the issue. Uh, and uh, I would say I picked out one issue to make things simple. There was about 16 or 17, but I picked out one that I could define put in there and work as an example for the whole um, um, case that I'm making. Um, so I, I, I've summarised this on the last sheet. Um, what I've said is, is that the uh, LRB are only involved in the planning process by ward councillor determination uh, and their involvement uh, may not occur if an accurate uh, ROH were available as a basis for decision. And it's therefore inappropriate for them to be involved prior to the uh, ROH being corrected. Um, the other point that I found a bit strange, the LRB are professionally advised by the planning authority. And there are doubts whether the advice received on technical planning issues would be sufficiently independent. Now, on the train coming down this morning, I noticed that you also have a, a paper, the brief you. And I would say that this, you know, without making a point, looks to be misleading as well, because it misses out the stage that the war councillors uh, are involved in, 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 within this report. Uh, so it, it's, it's not inaccurate, but it's not the full picture. 
Um, but I wouldn't expect the Information Centre to correct things um, in similar ways. I wouldn't expect the Plan Authority to, co to correct the report that they've uh, uh, generated. Um, so that basically is the, the, uh, the case I'm making. The other thing is that I'm not clear. Uh, that there was a, uh, I had the complaint which I've identified within the um, uh, report, and it wasn't examined. There must be something wrong with the system if a legitimate complaint isn't examined. Now, whether this is a procedural or operational failure, I'm not quite sure, um, because obviously I can't get the answers uh, on that. I can't get a, a, a full picture from the uh, local authority or the SPSO. Um, and, and what I've done here is just set out the basic facts. If, if, if these facts are obtained, then I, I could perhaps comment more on, on whether it's procedural or operational, in my opinion. Um, Thank you, Mr. Buston, for, for your uh, short presentation there. Uh, questions? Buston, do you think this is something that could be dealt with by guidance as opposed to requiring a change in legislation, either primary or subordinate legislation, that planning guidance by government could, could negate uh, the, the issue? Could be uh, yeah, done by guidance. Uh, and, uh, I mean, the situation would never have arisen if the... Uh, answer being provided straight away by the plan authority. Uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be sitting here mm -hmm. having followed this through for the last two or three years. Um, so, to, to some extent, uh, you know, the operational mm -hmm. way the thing was handled was poor. But I do think if, if there's extra guidance given so it is handled better, then fine. Mm -hmm. John? Thank you, Good morning, Mr. Buston. It's just the, the issue about additional guidance. Uh, versus legislation, just so that the committee are clear, because additional guidance just means that it's just additional guidance, and the local authority, the planning authority, can then take note of the guidance and apply the guidance in the way, in the manner <coughs> they see fit. And part of the issue that you've raised in terms of SPSO is they don't include the local councillor element to that. And having been a local councillor myself, I know in the authority that I served on the local councillor engagement, where it was a delegated planning uh, decision to the, an officer, would receive a weekly planning list of applications that had been submitted. Uh, and only if that, the local elected member then requested further information would the further information be provided. And if that further information wasn't requested or for it to go to full planning meeting, then that planning application would be dealt with by the delegated officer. So it's trying to address the issue that you have raised in terms of the local ward members being involved in a decision and how that would fit into potentially additional guidance being given to local authorities. How would you see that working out? Well, I, I, I would say that the ward councils have got to be involved if they're going to make a meaningful decision, of whether they call it in or not. They've got to look at the facts of the case. Um, therefore, I, I wouldn't have expected them just to look at a list and not... Um, you know, call the, uh, the report of handling in. Otherwise, they wouldn't have any idea of what the background to the decision was. As I said, I know from my own experience that yeah. it's basic information that the local authority I served on provided to the local elected member and still does. Yeah. Uh, and there's another member in this room who will be aware of the same mm. authority. Mm. Uh, but the, the issue was it would be the planning applicant's name the, the officer dealing with it, planning officer dealing with the planning application, the reference number, and say, for example, an extension to a dwelling house or a, a, a garage being added into the, the grounds. That's the type of basic information that the elected member, and I would say the majority of those descriptors are then just basically not signed off, but just looked at, and then, unless it does raise alarm bells, then local elected members uh, don't ask for it or don't ask for further information in terms of the planning application. So therefore, it's, the issue is, do you think the procedure is correct that we have delegated authority to officers to deal with planning applications that do not have to go through the full planning process? Yes, um, I, I, I you know, would uh, assume that the ward councillors, you know, because they're in a position where they've got to make a decision, 
um, to call in, would in fact want to have a look at this um, uh, report. The, the bare bones of the thing don't tell you anything. I mean, it's just a, a plan application for a you know, three-bedroom house, export, etc. No objections. Um, it, it maybe says that. But I think they've got to go a little bit deeper you know, in their capacity as ward councillors. But, but just to correct, the, 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 the ward councillor could only make uh, or request that the planning application be heard by a committee. They can't, make, they can't make a decision on the merits of the planning application has got to go to... And in Aberdeenshire, as we all know from the examples of uh, the history in terms of planning applications in Aberdeenshire, it's localised planning hearings that are held to actually determine the planning applications if they go to that pro through that process. So it's really just trying to work out the best way that you think we could deal with this petition uh, that would not only satisfy yourself, but also bring about changes that may impact on the other planning authorities throughout Scotland. Yeah. I mean, personally, I, I think it's a fairly big decision because I, I would much rather my case was heard by the Minister and that there was independent uh, um, review of, of the case. Uh, there are things like, uh, I, think, I think they call them PANS, planning advice notes, which are produced by the Minister which, in my case, I thought had been disregarded by the local planning authority. So I, I, I think I'd have got a better hearing on the opinions of the case if, I'd gone, if it had gone through the full council. They might have accepted it and, and then moved down uh, uh, to the minister because it would have been assessed professionally um, by people who give the overall uh, Scottish guidelines. Thank you. Your, uh, your petition calls Mr Buston for the Scottish Government to either eliminate or amend the notice of review for a period of three months. Uh, do you not believe that if we were to eliminate it, the, 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 there might be a concern with regards to what kind of impact that may have in other uh, areas of neighbouring properties or for new developments? Mm. Yeah, it, I, I mean, it depends on the time. I, 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 I've said from experience it took uh, three months to get uh, the council decision. In fact, the, the council uh, response came after the application date for uh, a, a local review meeting. Uh, and the SPSO response came six months later. Um, but I think there was some time taken um, in, in that because it was a fairly unusual case. Um, I, I, I would say if you had a, a limit of, say, a year or, uh, uh, or six months with caveats, or, um, then that would be uh, fine. The, the planning system currently operates independently of any local authority complaints procedure. Would you ideally like to see them both being linked? No, I, I, I think there's a case for, for separation, but I, I, what I'm asking is that uh, the integrity of the report is examined by the council complaints procedure and, and therefore it goes through uh, the, the uh, local authority, the council, it moves on to the SPSO, the SPSO give a decision and it's fed in right at the start. Uh, that, I mean all they do is say well we think this is wrong, this is wrong, this is misleading and hopefully the, the local authority will then amend the report of handling and it will go back in at the start, and the planning process continues with an accurate uh, report of handling. So, I, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that the, the, the planning dis, uh, 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 method is, is changed at all. Um, what I am saying is that it should start off with uh, an accurate basis, because it, 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 it's weak if you've got these inaccurate uh, uh, ROH going right through the system. So you did say, I would take it from your answers there, that uh, rather than see the, the process you know, eliminated, you, you, you'd like to see perhaps it amended. You yeah. did mention between six and 12 months uh, extension. Uh, do you think that's perhaps, is there any 
Yeah. Is there any other area where, where well, 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 personally, uh, I think uh, that's uh, perhaps a wee bit too long? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> would, would maybe four weeks extension or anything like that yeah. be more helpful? I, I, I think it could be longer, and, and I think there could be a caveat that um, it, it providing there's been um, an application made through the council complaints procedure, I mean, you know, it should allow the council complaints procedure to finish. And I can see the concerns that you were raising about uh, extending it too long because then it would, it would have to be a backlog of, 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 uh, of business on, on, on the hands of the uh, council. Yeah. Okay. Is there any other questions? If there are no further questions, could I perhaps ask the committee what action you would like to take in this petition? Right, the government. I think there is an issue. I find it very complex and technical and... I think what we're all keen to avoid is a change that would then impact upon delay and, and it, it's how it all brings it together, which is why I was asking about whether this could be dealt with without legislative change, which I think would be problematic. But it does seem to me right into the government to see whether this could be dealt, whether they think there is an issue, because there does seem to be something amiss here. Uh, and if so, what plans uh, they may care to take or have. Could I maybe add to that that we may be ahead you know, maybe right to heads of plan in Scotland uh, to maybe get a, a better feel of the situation. Mm -hmm. John? Convener, I agree with the two recommendations, but could also suggest we write to Planning Aid Scotland and Planning Democracy, uh, two organisations that may have a, an interest in the, the planning pro and do have an interest in the planning process, just to get a, a, an alternative perspective uh, from the those out there working in the planning field, working and advising in the planning field. Committee agree with the points raised then? Indeed. Right. Can I thank you, Mr Burston, for attending? I will now suspend for a minute uh, to allow you to leave and for the new petitioner to take your seat. The next petition is PE1561 by Karen Gray on behalf of Rabbits Require Rights Scotland on Pet Rabbit Welfare. Members have a note by the clerk and a spice briefing. Can I welcome Karen Gray to the meeting? I now invite you, Ms Gray, to speak to your petition. No more than five minutes to explain what your petition seeks and uh, we will then move to questions. Okay. First of all, thanks for having me here. Uh, obviously, taking the petition serious. Uh, I'm not the most confident speaker, so I'll try not to rabbit on too much. <laughs> uh, but basically, yeah, we need to give well rabbits. They do exist. Uh, out with, I know, obviously, people's views of them aren't always great. We've heard the stew recipes a million times. People hunt them. They're a pest in a while. But domestic rabbits do exist in the they exist in really large numbers. Uh, basically, there's no controls over breeding, so that is a knock-on effect on the welfare standards that's there, uh, because basically the breeders are unlicensed. Nobody's kind of, you know, gone in to visit to see what their setup's like to ensure proper diet and veterinary treatment and so forth. Uh, uh, also, like the health problems, just 
duty over breeding, cross breeding, so forth. There's a lot of di disease there, and possibly even genetic defects like dental issues. That's a kind of big problem. With, uh, as I said, it can be genetic. Uh, obviously, I've also noted that there's uh, the EU are introducing a breeders and sellers. Uh, animal health law from 2020, but again, there's still no mention of rabbits in that, so um, basically, I feel Scotland can set a standard here and either impl implement legislation or include rabbits in current legislation which already exists in the licensing of animal dealers, which covers cats and dogs, basically to get, you know, rabbits that bit of protection for their welfare. Um, as for kind of like a ban on pet shop sales, uh, similar to the ordinances in you know the north of USA and Canada, it's not that we want pet rabbits to disappear altogether. It's just they are out of control. The selling on it, um, as I say, people still view them as cheap, easy, cuddly, child friendly, and they're far from it. They're one of the most difficult pets. Just you know that I've had. Uh, just basically, they've got specific needs that are specific to their species. So they're certainly not cheap, they're not they're not cuddly, they don't like being picked up. Uh, of course they'll look cute, but as I say, they'll just look little furry monsters wrapped in fluff, to be honest. Um, and basically the pet industry does uh, very little to change these views. I mean, just recently there was a pet shop in Kilmarnock, it was one of the pictures, and that was one of many, you know, kind of, obviously a lot of, companies use Facebook and so forth to advertise their businesses and he's basically just saying oh it's great for kids the kids would love a bunny for Easter and it's like it's, it's like puppies for Christmas they still carry this on and you're like no because it leads to high levels of neglect what people don't realise is like, rabbits are basically they're driven for the need to breed um, obviously been a you know the predators out there they're constantly breeding and domestic rabbits are no different uh, they can reach up sexual maturi maturity from about 16 weeks. Uh, again, depends on the breed. And if you're taking that highly agile, active animal that's, you know, raging with hormones, um, and you're sticking it in a hutch, the kids are going and, you know, they're getting... They're not... People say they're aggressive. It's not that they're aggressive. They are just being denied their natural behaviours. So you're locking them basically in a prison. They're fearful of the humans coming in, and obviously they're getting mishandled, kids are noisy. As I say, not to say they make a good family pet, just not for kids, uh, certainly not in their own. Um, so basically, you know, they estimate there's about a million rabbits in the UK. Um, sorry, I'm lost here. Yeah. Pet business world, this, and this is from pet shops alone. Rabbit sales are maintaining their numbers about 1 million. But that's not taking into account your private adverts, online sales. So you're looking at approximately 1.3 million. Um, basically, there's a lot of surrenders because people are misunderstanding what they're taking on. Our rescues are struggling. And it's not just financial burden on you know, having the animal there, it's the health problems they come in with because they've been fed the wrong diet, they've got maybe got muscle wastage, they've not been to the vet, so they've got abscesses or dental issues. Um, the waiting lists are excessive. Um, it's hard to find homes for them as well. Because it's not just a case of giving some... They want to make sure that people have got the correct welfare. Um, you know, one place to give the rabbit a good home. They don't want to send it back to another neglected situation. And basically, all the while pet shop, online trading and all that, they're just continuing to breed and sell them or give them away even. Um, as I say, look, Pets at Home began a microchipping scheme in September, roughly, last year. And already the SSPCA have seen microchip rabbits. That they assume coming from Pets at Home, but they're already seeing them in their care. Um, so the House Rabbit Society in America, this. They recognise that it works well, but obviously it varies from state to state to city in America, so there is variations, and they would like it, you know, further spread out. So, as I say, it does work well, and they feel it's something that's, you know, tackles the welfare issues. Uh, as for creating minimum standards, look, this is just one hutch up 
I bought that not long ago just so I could make a point. And the company's ignored my complaints. Um, as I say, it says it's three foot in the box, but actually internally it's only 2.7 long. It's only 1.4 high at one end and it slopes down, so it's 1.1 foot at the other end and only 1.4 feet wide. So I put one of my rabbits in, he's an average size rabbit, just to get a photo on for compact. It couldn't even sit up properly. Um, so basically you're talking your average size rabbit needs at least 2 to 3 feet to fully stretch out to lie down to rest. 2 to 3 feet again just to stand up fully and stretch their bodies. And uh, rabbit welfare studies for the Hutch is Not Enough kind of, uh, campaign. They estimate about six to seven feet for one rabbit just to take three hops. So if you're confining a highly agile animal into that, it's cruel, basically. And that's, um, so basically, we need to set standards. The minimum recommendations is a hutch measuring at least six feet long, two feet wide and two feet high, but attached to a run of at least eight feet. So the animals are allowed to come and go as they please. Uh, carrying out their natural behaviours. They're most active in the mornings and the evenings. Um, so it's not just a case of when you remember to go and let them out, to give them a wee run around, giving them a couple of hours exercise. It, as I say, it's just not enough, really. So, as I say, they're buying hutches that size smaller sometimes. Uh, even just if you buy one four foot, five foot, it's still not enough. As I say, they get lonely, bored, frustrated. Um, and obviously being confined, uh, rabbits have been shown to develop osteoporosis after only six months being kept in a small cage because they've got a light and fragile bone structure, leads to thin thinning of the bones, uh, makes our bones more easier to break some fractures and muscle wastage is another issue. Um, so again, we really need to set obviously to improve welfare and make sure there's good products there and again that goes with the dietary stuff there's too much overfeeding the commercial food stuffs uh, as a rabbit they need to the mainstay diet should be hay grasses uh, so basically they're eating pellets commercial food in itself they're not wearing down their teeth so their teeth grow naturally um, so Basically, people going into pet shops are seeing bad standards all the time, and pet shops are perceived to be, you know, the kind of mainstay experts to people just going in off the street. Um, and they're seeing all these bad examples, bad products, but they think it's normal. So, as we say, we have basically been sold neglect where rabbits are concerned because uh, there's just not enough knowledge being passed on to customers. <clears throat> As that comes down to the kind of lies the same. Uh, well, Sorry. I appreciate, well, I appreciate yeah. you may have a lot more to say. The, uh, we I'm will, over. We will, <laughs> but if you just want to maybe come to a final point in your presentation, then we'll move on to questions. Yeah. Uh, well, again, that brings us, I suppose, with the licence laws. It really varies from authoritarian to authoritarian. It's based on the Pet Animals Act. It's 1951. It's old. It's outdated terms of licence are pretty basic in the wording. Um, there's no actual enforcement, so there's either lack of knowledge, inadequate training, financial restraint, so I'm, we're putting in complaints about conditions we've found, and nobody's really following up on them. Uh, as I say, one rabbit I ended up buying at a pet shop. It's not what we can do, but she ended up costing me over £1,285 in veterinary fees for a month from Bina and South Yorkshire Council, they just, you know, they ignored it. I was sold a sick rabbit and it's against the term of licence and so. Well, thank you very much, Karen, and you've done really well in your presentation. And uh, questions from members? Yeah. Kenny? I mean, it seems to me that you're obviously referring to some form of regulatory regime and there's also there's sale and there's possession. Who do you think is best placed to carry out such a regime monitoring guidance? Is it local authority? Is it an animal welfare charity? Or who? In terms of, well, we met recently with Mike Flynn and a couple of others at SSPCA, and they say they 
oversee the license condition in Inverness and they seem to feel it works well. So I'd, obviously that's for the SSPCA to, to decide if they'd be willing to carry it out. But as I say, the pet shop I got my rabbit from, I complained to the licensing, I complained to the SSPCA. The license inspector went in with a vet. We don't know the vet's background, so again, that's, that's another issue because rabbits are exotic species. So if you've not got an up-to-date you know, training in their health problems. Um, all they would have seen, really, if I left a rabbit there, it was a fat rabbit. But they said there was no problems. And, I mean, it was one of the most dirtiest, horrible, run-down pet shops. And I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. It was just dismal going in. But because the licensing authority says, oh, we can't find any problems, the SSC's PCA's inspector's hands were tied, so they can't really, you know, deal with any further. But... Mm. <coughs> Jackson? Yeah, thank you. You've obviously got a <coughs> sympathy and affinity for the species. Uh, I know nothing about rabbits, really, other than that um, I see them like everybody else does. Um, I'm interested, though, because I suppose what you caricature as the appeal in terms of the way they are marketed to children, insofar as I've ever known anybody to have a rabbit, that has actually been usually the case. They've had it because they have children. Uh, I'm far less aware, I think, of it being like guinea pigs and, and other things, uh, a, a pet that exists in a house without children. Mm -hmm. But you actually say, or I understood you to say, it's, it, in many respects, it's not a suitable pet. It doesn't. Rabbits don't like to be picked up. They don't like to be cuddled or intimidated by the presence of yeah. other of humans. Wh what is the appeal of a rabbit as a pet? They're actually, well, I'm fairly new to it. I mean, I got my first rabbit on a whim, I'll admit to that. I did buy her on a bit of a whim, and I didn't really realise what was taken on. But, I mean, no, oh, my rabbits are all house rabbits, only because I've not really got space out the back. But anyway, no, I mean, they're funny, they're active, they're cheeky, they're mischievous. I mean, I can't eat a hobnob, I've got a rabbit hanging off the end of my, my biscuit. But, it's, I mean, they are really affectionate. They'll jump up and they'll, they'll sit and snuggle into it. It's just the fact you can't... They're a prey. As soon as you pick them up off the ground, they can that same in an instant fear because it's not to say you've got to be able to handle them. You know, obviously, being an owner, you've got to be able to groom them and clip their nails. It's it's just getting them used to being handled. But as you know, kids, they just want something to mollycoddle. But as I say, it's not to say they don't make a good family pet. But I would kind of, you know, st especially young children, can hold them more responsible. You know, it's for the adult to teach their child, you know, good welfare, not just get a wee cute thing that they can put in a cage and terrorise, sadly. And, and is it your experience, then, that uh, there are pet dealers who are... Um, who handle the sale and care of rabbits more appropriately? Is it, is it a variable uh, yes. lack of awareness, or do you feel it's a universal one? Mm, there, uh, don't get me wrong, there is a good few knowledgeable people in pet shops and stuff we've come across, but overall, largely speaking, it is pretty poor out there. Uh, you try to make complaints, obviously people are defensive, which fair enough. But, I mean, you're making polite complaints, and I get told, uh, it's a pet shop in Troon, um, basically, I'm not listening to you, that man's got money in his pocket, away you go. And I'm like, but he had the rabbits in a tiny wee... You know, because they were at eye level, instead of having them in the big pen in the ground, they had them further up. And you're like, it's against the stocking density straight away in the, you know, the terms of licence for the space that are allowed in the cage. <clears throat> but generally, yeah, that's the attitude. They don't care. Sorry to say. OK, thank you. The... Uh Obviously, your petition is about pet rabbits and looking for measures to enhance the welfare. And, uh, and I'm sure most people would agree that there should be a minimum standard. And, uh, and the way that is done with other animals is through a code of practice. Yeah? Uh, codes of practice apply to animals that are kept as pets, but they're also uh, to animals that are used for meat production. Yeah? And rabbits would be both. How would this affect the code of practice? Or should it apply to both? 
I'm not saying there's no place for a code of practice, but I think initially we need to get, you know, set the minimum welfare in place. A code of practice is just, I suppose, it would be good for, like, so again, Mike Flynn says, it would be good for them to have a clear code so they know what checks to be, and then they can enforce, you know, improvements on owner as it stands just now. As long as that rabbit's got food and water in its hutch, there's, there's very little they can do, unless, obviously, there's, you know, cruelty or neglect there, but they can't say, oh, that hutch is, well, unless it's really tiny, but, you know, if they get see something about three or four feet hutch and the owner says, oh, we give it an hour out every day, their hands are tied, really, they can't. So for the SSPC and enforcement, but I think just to get the rabbits up to the same level as cats and dogs, because they are the third most popular pet in the UK, um, but again, they're the most neglected just because they're so freely available and people don't understand them and the products you buy are detrimental to health. And Considering then that, that uh, you know, the code of practice does you know, cover pets and those for meat products, do you think there should be a differentiation in, in, in I, the, the code of practice? I believe there already is codes for farming animals, but not uh, farming rabbits, but not. Uh, domestic, mm -hmm. so it's kind of weird that farming rabbits, laboratory rabbits, have actually got better welfare in place than domestic rabbits, mm -hmm. so I've got none. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there should be something there, definitely. Mm -hmm. and maybe just one final question. Uh, I, you did say that you had house rabbits. Could you maybe, for you know, uh, for me, could you tell me what did they prefer a, a lettuce or a hobnob? <laughs> <laughs> well, they shouldn't have eaten my hobnobs, unfortunately. No, they don't eat. They don't get fed lettuce. Right, lettuce okay. bad for them. But uh, right. I mean, eighty percent hay. That's the kind of mainstay. They get fresh greens, kale, parsley. I don't know. What a crest, they're better fed than me, that's for sure. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, given half a chance, they'll come up and try and pinch my dinner, but no. <laughs> and Zala? I just wanted to ask a, a question in terms of once a pet has actually been sold to someone, uh, how would they then uh, monitor and, po and pol police it? Because as you've already indicated, that most of the rabbits are sold are for children and the lifetime of a pet is going to be with a child um, now if that's the case how would you suggest that the policy would be policed if the child is the one with the pet most of the time anyway and I'm sure many of occasion it would be unsupervised mm. uh, how would you protect that animal how would you police it uh, well, certainly with the ordinances, that we can, uh, you know, stop selling them as freel in pet shops, but bring it introducing similar to the ordinances that exist in America. Now, uh, they are the pet shop, selected pet shops, not all obviously, work with rescues. So it's basically the rescues that are doing the checks. People are, you know, given a cooling off period to research, they're given all the literature, and then they're obviously matched up and so forth. So it's just basically. Reducing the numbers that's going through sales, and you know, obviously helping the show. Rabbits are never going to disappear, and we don't want them to disappear. We just want them protected, and you know, just stop breeding them and selling them like sweeties, which is basically happening. So, yeah, I mean, there is. Well, most independent rescues will work with owners to ensure they have the good welfare in place, proper housing, understand their diet and vet needs and so forth. So Yeah, I, I don't think you've addressed my question. My question is, how do you actually police it then? Uh, I mean, the rabbits which actually end up in households yeah. and with children most of the time, and many of occasions it will be unsupervised, mm. how, how do you propose that would be policed? I suppose that would be for the rescues to kind of like home check, if you know no, what. I, I, think, I think we need to give people guidance. Yeah. We, can, we can't just throw the responsibility to somebody without actually advising on what measures that are, would mm. be available to them. Yeah, well, it's, not, it's not as if it's a TV that they can have a van outside, you know, <laughs> I know de de detecting that. a rabbit <laughs> in the house. You know, we, we need to be practical about this. Yeah. And I, I'm, I, this is a very, uh, it's a very serious question that if you have a, a child with a, uh, with a pet, how do you propose to monitor that treatment of that animal with that child? It's the adult's responsibility to really teach the good welfare to the kids. I mean, you can't monitor people with cats and dogs either, mm. so it's like... Um, 
So it's a similar situation. Yeah. You're it's... not looking for anything oh, different no. from what's already in place then, with the exception of the sale. Yeah, well, as I say, reducing the sales, kind of, you know, getting there's, that there's welfare. There's no guarantee the sales would be reduced. I mean, that's that's the point I'm trying to make. You don't think it would be reduced, no? No, I, I, I mean, how, how, how do you propose? <laughs> so, what? I'm just not having them available in every pet shop, really, rabbits. Um, okay. John. Thank you. And, you know, good morning, Karen. Okay. One of the things that you haven't asked for in, in your main petition is that the accurate information and advice is given to potential owners, uh, because there are being a parent and having you know, a daughter who always wanted a rabbit and you know, going to uh, one of the rescue centres and getting a couple of rabbits from there and knowing the, the history of the rabbits from that rescue centre and the medical needs of the rabbits that we actually took from the rescue centre. I know the, the issues that are around yeah. there. I also know the inoculation regime that needs to take place with rabbits, which many owners don't understand about. Uh, you've made in your, the main body of your petition, you've referred to uh, veterinary advice and uh, making sure they get regular checkups. You mentioned in your contribution about getting, if they're not outside, if they're particular of house rabbits, they need re their uh, toenails regularly clipped uh, because they, they don't have the natural instinct to scratch in the ground. So it's those kind of issues. So I was, I was quite surprised that you didn't say, as well as you know, not completely banning the sale of uh, the rabbits and appropriate pet shops, but making sure that, the, similar to the rescue centres, the appropriate advice, information and guidance is given, including the particularly, more importantly, the health implications of maintaining a rabbit and also the potential age span or the lifespan of a rabbit because you know, many people think, like cats and dogs, can rabbits last 10, 15, 20 years. Unfortunately, rabbits have got a shorter lifespan than that and it's just trying to get that message over uh, to, uh, and how they get that message over in relation to the sale uh, and whether or not appropriate sales are paying place. Because you did mention that one pet owner said, that man's got money in his pocket and I'm going to sell him a rabbit. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you stop that? Oh, in the terms of licence, they're supposed to be providing you care advice at the point of sale anyway. So uh, whether it's displayed you know, in a sign or you get a leaflet of verbal, it's that already allegedly in the terms of licence. But yeah, no, there does need to be more education and awareness is key. Um, as I say, when uh, Dobby's Garden Centre laid signs up saying rabbit is only four to five years lifespan, you're like, no, rabbits can live up to 12 years, possibly even more, depending on the breed. So even the, the advice I've got is not consistent. So you kind of, but as I say, within the terms of licence, if we implement it, look, I can't remember the exact name, it's the new model pet vending, 2013, they've actually got set requirements, conditions on how rabbits are, you know, handled, housed and fed, etc. so on in the pet shop and, you know, the care advice being full and correct. Thank you. So. Okay. Any further questions? Could I ask the committee what action that we'd like to take in this petition? Uh, Kenny? Uh, uh, I think there is an underlying issue here. I was taken by the, the comment made about uh, rabbits being classified as exotic pets, having been around the SSPCA uh, welfare centres. It's not simply rabbits, never mind cats and dogs, but chinchillas, salamanders, exotic birds, you name it. Uh, we live in a global world and animals are now being traded and openly sold. I don't necessarily know what the solution is here, but I think an issue has been raised and it would therefore be appropriate to ask the government for their take on what may be their thoughts with regard to rabbits and perhaps even the wider issue, although that isn't the petition as such before us, but certainly also raising it with the SSPCA and the uh, uh, Pet Industry Federation. It seems to me there's something there. Just what can be done 
I don't know, and there's a difference between the point of sale and how you monitor and look after, given there's statutory powers and animal welfare, presumably for, for the SSPCA, but initially flagging up the issue, given that it does some, seem to have been commercialised by some big firms, never mind small firms. I was just wondering, uh, uh, Kenny, whether the, it might be more appropriate to write to you know both organisations that you Absolutely. mentioned before, write to the Scottish sure. Government, and then we could give them a full picture of, of what the other parts of the industry are saying. Sensible. Yeah. Agree with that? Yep. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, and thank you very much, Karen, uh, for attending and giving your presentation. I'll now suspend for a minute. Excuse me, the final new petition today is PE1567 by Donna O'Halloran on investigating on ascertained deaths, suicide and fatal accidents. Members have a note by the clerk in a spice briefing. Uh, the petitioner did not want to attend today, so may I simply invite the committee to consider what action it wishes to take on this petition. Members have a note by the clerk suggesting a possible course of action, and I understand that the petitioner is keen for her petition to, to be referred to the Justice Committee. What are the members' views? Yeah, not really sensible. No. Everybody agree then it should go to the We're Justice going, Committee? The, the fatal accident inquiry legislation is going through, so I think Mr Halloran is very opportune at her time, and it would be, I think, inappropriate for us to do anything other than send it to them and ask them to consider it as part of their wider discussion and debate on Lord Cullen's work that's been outstanding for some time. Members agree with that approach? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item three is consideration of continued petition. And the next item of business is consideration of nine continued petitions. And the first petition is PE1098 by Lynn Merrifield on behalf of the King Seat Community Council on school bus safety. Members have a note by the clerk and submissions. Uh, can I invite contributions from members? David? Convener, I'm in mind to close this pet petition, seeing as the Scottish Government has ex expressed its intention to take the legislation forward in the next Parliament session. Members agree with that? Yeah. Point of action? Thank you. The next petition is PE1105 by Major McCanns on St Margaret's of Scotland Hospice. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. And can I welcome Gil Patterson, MSP, uh, to the meeting, who has a constituent interest in the petition. Can I invite contributions from the members? It would be inappropriate at this juncture, although progress has been made, it's very much welcome. There's still a, 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 an underlying issue. And Perhaps in these circumstances, it would be appropriate to ask the government to return to us once the forum that has been established has reached some firmer conclusions, uh, and we could then take a take a more informed decision with the full facts before us. Any other members got any, anything to say? Yeah, I'd be keen to hear from the local member who's come along today to. Uh, hopefully make a contribution in this debate before uh, taking anything further forward on this issue. I'm grateful for that, uh, uh, Convener. Um, I was actually hoping that I could hear today that uh, you know the parties uh, could be agreeing to come together and uh, secure uh, uh, an accountancy firm that can take this forward. Um, you know, I, of course, it's got to be something that both parties are, are comfortable with. Uh, I, and I, I really feel that uh, if uh, new eyes uh, look at what's, uh, what's there and find something 
I, I do think that the Health Board would respond uh, positively. I, I, I think the gap between the two uh, is not that much, to be quite frank with you. And uh, Sister Rita, who <coughs> is the Chief Executive of the Hospice, has already said progress has been made uh, uh, prior to the suggestion that, uh, that both parties come together. So I was hoping that I could sit quietly and hear if there had been moves towards that because I think that, that's really the crux of the matter. Someone, I think, has got to measure in some way what happens between uh, St Margaret of Scotland Hospice and the other uh, establishments. And until that happens, I think there's always going to be a question. For, 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 uh, from, from my part, I, I do think there is a discrepancy. However, I, I, I do believe because of the action that the Health Board, when matters have been taken to the Health Board, and I've been part of that process, to be quite frank with you, then they do respond. And I do think that if we uh, can have new eyes look at it, as I said earlier on, and find that there is something there to be addressed, I actually think it will be. I think it's in the health board's interest that that happens. And it's just a matter, I, I do believe, of uh, sitting down, looking at the situa situation, have some measurement to it, and then come to a conclusion. So I was hoping that, that maybe the committee would have some information from me today yeah, in that well, regard. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I mean, this is not the forum for, I, I don't believe in considering the issues that you've just raised there. You know, this is more of a specific issue. And, I mean, this petition has been on the table now since 2007, and I've heard of work in progress, but I think this goes beyond work in progress. I think somewhere down the line, you know, a, a, a resolution has to be found. And, but it would appear for me from the original uh, emphasis of the petition that, you know, we've now come down to this specific issue and it's, uh, you know, the, the, the thing between the health board and, and obviously St Margaret's Hospice. And I think there's two roles. I think, one, we can continue to keep the, uh, the, the, the petition open, but I think probably as a constituency MSP, uh, Mr Parson, I think probably... Uh, you know, having done it myself, being a constituency MSP, when I think there's a deadlock somewhere, you know, the first thing I do is try to facilitate a meeting uh, between the, the relevant partners to see what the real problem is. So I would probably encourage you that, that that may be something you may want to take up. And I think the second thing is that, you know, I think as Kenny McCaskill said there, I think we keep it open, you know, and hopefully the additional pressure, you know, that you know, that somebody is looking over their shoulders, that we're looking for a resolution. But I think, you know, the part that I've just emphasised and uh, that, that, that perhaps you should be maybe doing something uh, to help, I think, progress this, because it has been eight years outstanding. And I say we've moved from the what was the original issue to a single issue. Can I come back on that? Yeah, I appreciate the point that you make, but however, at the, the last meeting of the Petitions Committee, I... The Petitions Committee did write uh, to the Health Board and I was hoping that uh, the, the last thing that I wanted to do is interfere in that process, to be quite frank with you. I was hoping that, that you know, we would get some feedback on that and some movement or, uh, in that regard. I, and I'm, I'm more than happy, I'm more than happy I, to actually ga engage in that fashion. But I, I've got to put my cards on the table. Uh, I wouldn't engage in that process without uh, the hospice uh, asking me to do so. Uh, the last thing that I think that I would be overstepping uh, my authority, you know, this is this has been going a long time. Some of the issues have certainly been cleared. Uh, there's no question about that. We have made progress. And as I said, I was hoping that there's just this one stumbling block at this present time uh, is that uh, bringing the parties together with some someone that accounts the firm that both are <coughs> comfortable with, and then I think after that, I think this this the, we will be at the end game uh, until that happens. So I was looking for the benefit from the petitions co committee, yeah. but I would need to go back with your suggestion to the hospice to see if they wanted yeah. me D to. Did you get a copy of the, the 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 health board's uh, response? No, I have nothing from. No. We can certainly forward that to you. I'd be grateful and, for that. Uh, we, we'll yes. I've, I've came here blind today. Right, OK, then. Uh, you, uh, convener, if I could ask Mr Parson, I mean, 
and declare an interest as somebody who's been involved over the years in support of the St Margaret of Scotland Hospice as well. Um, I mean, there is a, a question for the committee, uh, Ms Patterson, as to whether or not the advances that are now being made are facilitated by the petition remaining open, or whether we've reached a point where the original objectives of the petition have been secured and that the detail now underway is not one which is materially affected by the petition still being an open petition or not. And I think, in a way, the committee is looking... I mean, it can't lie open forever, but I think the committee is willing to respond to your guidance on the matter at this stage, but I, I think we would like to know whether you think that is still a productive thing for the committee to leave the petition open, because it would affect, I think, the judgment of most of us in coming to a final conclusion this morning. Well, I've, I, actually, I've always thought that the, the good work of the committee has been instrumental in many ways of keeping the momentum going. Um, and uh, the, you know, the, the uh, hospice itself serves uh, much of the members in here's uh, uh, constituents, whether they're uh, of a uh, uh, relig uh, religious uh, view or not. It's all comers at the, at the hospice, to be quite frank with you. But I, I think it's a, it's a benefit to keep it open. And my worry is that at this particular time, uh, <coughs> and I, I listened carefully what to what the, the, the convener said, that at this particular time, if the committee was to close it, it would seem as if it's a done deal. For me, it's not a done deal uh, at this stage. But I, I generally believe, uh, I'm not one to overstate things, uh, I'm, I'm, I genuinely believe we're very close to it, and I, I firmly believe. I, I mean, it's if if it's measured by an independent uh, accountancy firm, chartered accountancy firm, then that's when we'll, we'll know exactly where it is. I do feel that something will be found there, and that the health board will respond positively, because when things have been brought to their attention, they have. And Sister Rita mm -hmm. is on record of saying that things have moved on, mm -hmm. but there's just a little bit to go. So I would ask, I would ask uh, that the petitions committee uh, keep it open. At I mean, this, the, at this point. Well, the commission's already agreed that we're going to keep it open. Oh, but, right, but, but, but can I ask open. you what, what uh, you know, what influence or what action you have taken with regards to this, as you know, the constituency MSP? Well, I come along here, but I also engage uh, all the time uh, with the hospice itself. And I've had, uh, you, you, I, you to, I'm guessing here, maybe 10 meetings, private meetings with the health board uh, on this matter. But I haven't had any meetings with the health board since the government had brought the two parties together and suggested that an independent uh, a person, a, a company, be brought in because I haven't put anything in the papers. I, I don't use it for publicity reasons. It's been gone a long time, never been involved in the papers. It's not for me that I, I do this. But I felt that if, since this is where we're at, that it would be wrong for me to interfere in any way. It's not my purpose to interfere, unless I'm sp specifically asked by the hospice to do so, or by the health board. So I, I, I'm going to take your, uh, the, the, the point that you make convener and I'll purposely ask the hospice if they want to, me to do that very thing but I think that the solution isn't Gil Patterson the solution is both parties sitting down agreeing who this accountancy firm, that's what it is at the present time the, 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 the agreement is that an accountancy firm would look at this and deliberate on it and then after that I don't think I can come back here, to be quite frank. If that happens, we'll get the answer mm -hmm. that we're all seeking. Anzala? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, no, uh, my colleague uh, Jackson Carlos' line of <coughs> questioning has been very helpful, uh, and also the contribution made by the local member. Uh, I'm, I'm also of the same view that I think we want this to continue to be open, but I think uh, another nudge wouldn't go wrong in terms of trying to get a response. I think we need to encourage people to bring this to a, a, a speedy conclusion. And I think the committee needs to actually write once again to say that we're still waiting for that to happen. And when, if they could indicate when that's likely to happen. I think that's important. You're quite right to point out it's been going on for quite a long time now. We really need to bring this to an end. And we need, uh, particularly the Scottish Government, to try and perhaps influence a speedy resolution to this matter. Okay. Any further questions? 
John? It's not a question as such, convener, but it's just a comment. I think the issue raised by Kenny McCaskill in terms of the hospices forum is a good one. I think there are, is work still to be done there, I think, in terms of the wider issues that St Margaret's of Scotland hospice raised. But having sat on the committee, uh, I think the whole of the period this petition has been before us, and also having visited St Margaret's uh, of Scotland hospice, I think there are, there are issues that still need to be resolved. I'm glad that we've got to the stage where we're at, but I think Gil Patterson's right. There's, we need to keep it open to keep that spotlight on the issue. Because I think if we close the petition, then the issues being raised by the hospice might be lost uh, because the, the perceived lack of committee interest on the issue. And given that we have been dealing with this for eight years, then it would be useful just to try and get some conclusion. But I think part of the conclusion that, um, that I would like to seek is the agreement between the hospice and the health board, possibly along with the Scottish Government, to sit down and look at who the accountant uh, would be, because clearly the hospice have raised issues about the appointment of Grant Thornton. But unless the hospice can come up with other suggestions, then I think we need to uh, suggest that we, we go forward uh, on the basis of that, and hopefully we can get a resolution uh, fairly soon. But I, as I said, I would be loath at the present moment to close the petition. I would, but I, I think, as a committee, we should write to the Scottish Government Greater Glasgow Health Board and the hospice uh, to see if we can encourage the three parties to sit down with the government mediating in that to get an, a, an appropriate accountant appointed uh, to actually take the issues raised forward uh, and we can get some conclusion to this issue that satisfies everybody concerned, particularly the petitioners. Any further questions? OK, then, we agree to keep the petition open and we'll take forward the, the action points that have been raised. Agreed? Thank you. Thank you. The next petition is PE1458 by Peter Cherby on the register of interest for members of the Scottish judiciary. Members have a note by the clerk and its submissions. Uh, can I invite contributions from members? Kenny? It would be appropriate to hear from Gillian Thompson, the new uh, judicial complaints uh, reviewer. I think she's a fresh pair of eyes and just asking for her reflections and, uh, in her new role may give some insight. Everybody agree with that? Any other questions? Do we... Jackson? I, I agree with Mr McCaskill. I understand the Lord President is due to retire in due course and we will wish him well. He will leave knowing that he's managed to protect all the vested interests that he has so assiduously sought to represent in the conduct of this petition. And since we will be hearing from a new, uh, from, from Gillian Thompson, who is new to her position, uh, it may even be that there'll be a more enlightened uh, engagement with the Lord President's successor. So I'm all for keeping the show on the road. Uh, well, I, you know, like many probably recognise that people think the existing safeguards are robust, but, you know, are they sufficient? And uh, the problem is that the public cannot see that they are robust, even though that may well be the case, and I think, you know, inviting Gillian uh, Thompson in to give an evidence would be appropriate. So I would agree with the national okay. grade. Thank you. The next two petitions are to be considered together. They are the PE1513 by Ron Park on equal rights for unmarried fathers and PE1528 by John Ronald on child co court reform. Members have a note by the clerk and, and submissions. Can I invite contributions from members? Well, I think on this occasion, convener, we've got, uh, it would be sensible for us, whatever uh, sympathies we might have had initially to the petitions and the way in which they were raised to uh, move to close the petitions on the basis that there is very clear opposition to the principles that underpin them and there is no prospect of the legislative changes that were being sought being enacted and with such a decisive uh, position ahead as that there is little further this committee can do. 
Any other questions? Anzala? I'm, I'm, I'm slightly differently minded in the sense that whilst I see the way the petition is put together, I think the, the petition itself could have been put together somewhat differently because what I'm keen to ensure is the rights of the child rather than the parents. And I genuinely feel that the child should have the right to be able to engage with all its, all its parents, um, whether it's mother or father. And therefore, if one um, parent decides they're not going to let access to the other parent, I think that's wrong. I think they're denying that child its right to engage with its its parent. So um, while I don't want to make an issue of this current petition in front of us, I do genuinely believe and feel that if a petition came in front of us which was focused in a different way, um, I would be more uh, persuaded to, to support that because I, did, I, do, I do believe that the idea about um, equality is important, but the equality that I'm looking at or the equal rights that I'm looking at, at is for the actual child rather than the parent. I think that's important that uh, uh, every child should have uh, uh, an equal and fair opportunity to engage with uh, both sets of parents. Any other? Kenny? I have to say, Jackson Carlo, I think we've come to the end of the road here. It's quite clear that the government's not uh, prepared to legislate, and I have to say I have great sympathy with them on that. Equally, other organisations have also made their views. There are difficult cases, but the older days that uh, uh, springs to mind listening to Hanzala Malik is, you know, hard cases make bad laws, uh, basically. Uh, tragedies and difficulties exist, but it seems to me this is now down to a political battle. There may be, once we come to another political term, a further court reform or family law act, but there's no, no plans or proposals before us for you know amendments to family law, and it's something that may reoccur post-2016, although I'm not necessarily, uh, uh, or don't necessarily think it's likely, but I think at the present moment, there's nothing that we can do. We've exhausted all channels, and it's at the end of the road. Okay, any, uh, any further? Does the committee then agree to close both petitions? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. The next petition is PE 1517 by Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy on behalf of the Scottish Mesh, Mesh Survivors. Hear our voice campaign on Mesh and medical devices. Members have a note by the clerk and the uh, and submissions, and can I welcome <coughs> Can I welcome uh, Neil Finlay, MSP, to the meeting, who has an interest in this petition, and can I now invite contributions from members? We have, uh, this is a, an interim and an update, I think, in relation to this petition, which all of us regard as being uh, of uh, very considerable importance. Um, I, I know we have a, a series of actions recommended by the clerks, which follow really on from the direction that we have previously agreed. Um, and so I'm happy to accept those uh, action points as identified that we uh, are invited to note the revised time table for publication of the independent reviews report, and we agree that the evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary, Dr Wilkie, and the European Commissioner will be scheduled after the report has been published. I think that's consistent with the view we took previously. Um, also, that the committee write to the European Commission's Scientific Committee on emerging and newly identified health risks um, to make it aware of our interest in all of this and requesting an update on when their uh, report on uh, polypropylene transvaginal mesh devices uh, will be published. In addition, as the committee has not yet sought the views of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists or the British Society of, I'm not even going to attempt that, members may wish to consider seeking of submissions from these. I think that seems perfectly sensible too. Uh, we, I think this committee is very much the forefront of taking these issues forward. Um, I think it's interesting beyond this committee 
the extent to which public awareness is continuing to grow across Scotland and further afield, the interest that there is in the work that this committee has been able to progress in relation to all of this, um, and also our determination, I think, throughout uh, not to lose sight of the very considerable uh, human consequence which we've bore, to which we've borne witness as members of this committee in this parliament. And I, I think that uh, is very much the, recommend, the, the course of action we should continue to follow. I'm merely here observing the, the committee this morning, the convener, and I'm very supportive of the uh, proposals that have been put forward. I think uh, Mr Carlo is absolutely right that the, um, very much the eyes of the the, the world, the medical world, is, is upon this committee for, uh, in relation to this petition and um, all that falls from it. So I would certainly be supportive of the uh, proposals that are being put forward. And um, as I say, many people are watching very closely what is happening. I can now say as the British Society of Urogynecology, my eyes just weren't looking at the paperwork at the right <laughs> moment. <laughs> Joint motion. Thank you, Convener. Support the suggestions made by Jackson Carlow in terms of the actions of the committee, but could I strengthen that slightly? Uh, I know the Cabinet Secretary has written to the European Commission to find out what the timetable would be, uh, the new timetable for uh, the report. But could I suggest we as a committee also ask when we're writing uh, to the European Commission Scientific Committee uh, to actually stress the timetable issue uh, because we're keen to examine this. But I could also suggest when we're writing that we refer them to the evidence that we have heard as a committee because I know having been on other committees that have visited the European Commission, the Commission are very interested in some of the debates and discussions that are taking place in this Parliament and are keen to hear some of the evidence that the committees are taking uh, so that they can add that to their knowledge of debate that's taking place. And, particularly in the Scottish Parliament, because I'm keen that, uh, in terms of the review and the report, that it takes on board the concerns and issues raised by patients who have identified problems. Uh, because while we, we heard the evident, earlier evidence uh, from uh, Adam Slater, uh, I think it would be incumbent upon us to actually refer some of the evidence we've heard from the patients and refer them on to the either articles or the website uh, that has been developed uh, and take account of some of the issues and experiences that have been relayed uh, by the patients and their concerns. Uh, so I think it, it would be useful if we added that into our uh, correspondence with the European Commission Scientific Committee to ensure that they get, they're getting the whole picture of the debate that's taking place in this committee and the debate that's taking place in Scotland. When Mr Slater gave his evidence, he did um, agree to forward us a whole uh, number of uh, pieces of documentation that he had. Um, uh, I, I certainly have not received that yet. I don't know if that's been received by the committee clerks and, or if it's not. But if that's possible, could that be followed up? Because I think it's very important. Okay, we'll, we'll, fo we'll follow that up, uh, uh, Neil, and, and uh, remember quite clearly you know that that, that being mentioned, and I think from the uh, uh, the you know the interest in this obviously this petition has uh, uh, certainly uh, more or less been certainly been more it's worldwide and and was, was the fact that I think what's interesting for me is the fact that the number of uh, mesh implants has reduced considerably, you know since it was first raised here and uh, and. You know, and I'm, I'm really disappointed in the fact that the, uh, you know, the independent view has, has certainly not been completed yet. And I think taking on board the points that John and, and others have made that we go forward with the action points and, and I think we, we, you know, we write uh, and say that how disappointed we are because there are, you know, a number of, of women out there who are going through a worrying time as it has and any further delays and, and you know, the independent view coming is certainly not going to be helpful. So uh, do we agree, members, that, that, that we go forward with action points? Yeah, Agreed. The, 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 the European External Relations Committee also took evidence on this issue, and there may be uh, more information available through the committee clerks from that committee as well. That might be helpful. Okay. Uh, 
So we agreed that the, the action points uh, uh, to go forward, and can I thank Mr Fernley for attending the meeting? <coughs> The next petition is PE 1539 by Anne Booth on Housing Associations to come under the Freedom of Information Act 2002. Uh, members have a note with the clerk and the submissions, and can I invite contributions from members? Uh, well, colleagues, as a firm believer in transparency and freedom of information, I am sympathetic towards the aims of this petition, and I note that the inclusion of RSLs within the scope of this legislation has been looked at several times, broadly supported, but never sanctioned. So I would therefore be keen to repair this petition to the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee, and perhaps in doing so we could draw the attention to the willingness of the Information Commissioner to give evidence on this matter. Angus? Yeah, I would agree, um, Convener. Uh, certainly, loath to, to close the petition at this stage. Um, I, I believe there's merit in what the petition is uh, calling for. Therefore, uh, a referral to the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee is, uh, is the, the preferred option. So, I would agree. Okay. Members agreed? Agreed. Thank you. The next petition is P1542 by Evelyn Mandel on behalf of Ben Mandel and Malcolm and Caroline Smith on human rights for dairy farmers. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. And can I welcome Jimmy McGregor, MSP, and Dave Stewart uh, to this meeting? And can I invite contributions from members? Um, thank you, uh, Convener, for allowing me to make a short statement in support of my constituents in this very long-running issue. I, raised this ring, uh, I also raised this ring fence issue in the recent dairy debate in Parliament, uh, hoping it might be dealt with by the Cabinet Secretary, but uh, he did not, in fact, mention it at all in his closing speech. In that debate, though, other members did correctly confirm producers in this area were caught in a monopoly position. And it is now five years since I first spoke to the Public Petitions Committee, and my view hasn't changed. It was unfair and disproportionate to expect constituents like Mr and Mrs Mundell and other dairy farmers in Kintyre to forfeit their property and ruin their businesses in the name of supporting the wider community. Many of these businesses had been built up over generations. That's the nature of farming. The Scottish Government should now accept it was a human rights issue and that most of those it consulted would have no knowledge of human rights legislation. Individual dairy farmers themselves were not consulted. I believe this petition should be continued and further questions asked of the Scottish Government so that the genuine concerns of Mr and Mrs Mandel and others can be addressed. And if you'll just allow me, I would like to read out um, a short statement from my constituents who've travelled all the way to be here and are actually sitting in the audience. We simply cannot understand why government are not being asked to correct the factually incorrect statements they previously made to the Public Petitions Committee. We believe from the 12 documents which we submitted to the Public Petitions Committee that we have demonstrated that individual dairy farmers were not dealt with fairly regarding the Southern Isles milk quota wing fence. Consultations were not done correctly. Government knew for years that the milk price was below the cost of production. This is a scandal on a par with the mis-selling of protection, payment protection insurance, except that for the individual victims concerned, the consequences were much more devastating. It is now 15 years since we first sought justice and almost six years since we submitted the first petition. This is completely the responsibility of the Scottish Parliament and we feel it is totally unfair to expect widows and pensioners, as most affected now are, to take government to court to elicit justice. If the Public Petitions Committee and government cannot find a solution, then we think there should be a public inquiry. And that's the end of my statements. Thank you, Convener. David, would you? Yeah. 
So, uh, thank you, convener, and can I thank the committee for allowing me to come along, along with uh, Jimmy McGowan, to make a few points um, in which to add to the case. I mean, I've also been dealing with Mr. and Mrs. Medell for uh, three or four years, uh, but before that, Peter Peacock, um, my former colleague, was uh, heavily involved uh, with the case. It, as Jimmy McGowan said, it is a very complicated case, and I, I know members would have read very carefully uh, all the background papers. Um, it is, of course, to do with ring fencing of milk quotas, but it's a much wider issue. I think the fundamental issue here um, is about human rights and how you access human rights. Um, SPICE has very helpfully provided me with a specific paper, which I've passed to Mr and Mrs Medell, who are in uh, the gallery today, uh, about issues, convener, around legal aid and how you access that. And I, of course, appreciate that in order to access your human rights within Scots law, you need to go through the various stages and levels of Scots law. Um, I won't uh, delay the committee to talk about the difficulties in getting legal aid, uh, but perhaps uh, say one couple of points on that, uh, that the family have been in touch with over 50 lawyers, either in person uh, or by phone. Uh, the vast majority will not touch human rights cases, and for those that have done, they tell me that they would only deal with prisoners or, though, or those who have got an immigration issue around human rights. And just to give you one example, for one of the cases, one of the lawyers that did agree to take the case, they wanted £25,000 up front. So there is a wider issue uh, on this. In terms of what action could the committee now do, I obviously appreciate with my formal role how uh, important it is that petitions are moved on and that you don't want to get logged down with a whole series of petitions that are there year after year. Um, I have, as you would expect, a very specific bit of information that I would like to, to put to you, uh, and that is that I would suggest that we do a very, very brief, or the committee rather, just a very, very brief uh, mini-inquiry, which looks at the circumstances of the formal ring fenced area, because it no longer exists anymore, obviously, uh, with milk quotas ending, uh, in the Southern Isles, um, looking at the social and economic circumstances of the farmers in that area, because this case is not just about Mr and Mrs Medell. This faces lots of other farmers who, frankly, as Jimmy McGurr said, have found that their livelihood has been effectively killed off by this. This is a breach of European human rights, and I think a very, very straightforward, discreet inquiry looking into the effects of farmers in the Southern Isles area would be very, very benef beneficial. And I know from the previous experience, the fearless way that the Petitions Committee took on the judiciary over the Registrar of Interests, and secondly, the great work that the committee has done on social issues over child sexual exploitation. So I think there should be another piece uh, in the armoury of saying what an excellent piece of work the petition to pity has done. I think this would be very, very helpful. It's not just about one family, much as they're in a terribly tragic position. I think there's been a major miscarriage of justice. I think it's a tragedy what's happened, not just to Mr and Mrs Dell, but literally scores of other families who've seen their livelihood ruined because of what's happened in the ring fencing of milk quotas. Angus? To say that's a complete, I believe that's a complete overreaction to the, the, the current situation from uh, Mr Stewart. I, I think the salient point in this case uh, is that the EU milk uh, quota regime was abolished uh, this year on the 1st of April. Uh, and therefore, it's unlikely that the Scottish Government would be willing to look at this uh, retrospectively, particularly given the, the Scottish Government's stance uh, to date. Um, however, the Cabinet Secretary has launched uh, the Scottish Dairy Plan uh, and acknowledged the challenges facing the islands and, and remote areas, including uh, clearly uh, the, the area of, of Kintyre. Um, the Scottish Government has advised that it uh, does not accept the premise of the petition that Mr and Mrs uh, Mandel's human rights were breached, uh, and given that the Scottish Human Rights Commission has advised the committee uh, that this is an issue that only a court could rule on, um, I think that uh, should be taken on board, and, and of course taken on board the fact that uh, the petitioners have approached a number of, of lawyers to date. Um, now, I know the petitioners feel very uh, passionately that they have been uh, let down, particularly their disappointment that they weren't consulted uh, as part of the independent review to ring fencing provision in, in 2011. Um, so, by all means, it certainly might be worth highlighting their, their disappointment to the, the Scottish Government. However, in doing so, um, I would be minded to, g given, given uh, what I've already stated, I'd be minded to close the petition uh, given that the Scottish Government does not accept the charge uh, that the petitioner's rights were uh, breached. 
um, but to place on record uh, and acknowledge the clear frustration uh, that the petitioners have uh, gone through in the, in, in the past few years. Um, if that's not acceptable to the committee, then um, the other option would be, given that uh, the Rural Affairs Committee are actively monitoring the, dairy, the current dairy crisis, uh, it may be a, a possibility to, to refer the petition to uh, the Rural Affairs Climate Change and Environment Committee. However, I feel a mini inquiry by this committee would not address the fundamental issues that, uh, that they would seek to, to do. Anjala. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Convener, it's always, a, it's always a shame when uh, citizens have to fight against a brick wall of the government to get justice. I think that's an awful shame. And when uh, we've put our citizens in a position where they financially can't stand up to our government, that's even worse, because the government's here, are here to serve the people and to serve them fairly. Now, I'm of the opinion that I know that this has been going for a, a, a period of time. Um, I do feel that there is a, a, a case to be answered for. And just because the petitioners are not financially able to doesn't mean that they should be denied justice. I think that that's, that's an often sin. And therefore, um, I would suggest, uh, convener, if at all possible, if we did carry out a mini-inquiry, that could possibly help both parties out. Uh, I think that would be helpful, um, and, and I, I don't want to pass the buck on. I think you know this is this is this is a situation where we we really need to uh, ensure that we do the very best for our citizens when they come to us for help, and he, clearly they've come to us for help, and and I think we need to go that extra mile if need be to ensure that they get as as close to justice as possible, and therefore I I, I genuinely believe that we should be doing more for this particular family and others who've suffered in, in, in that circumstance. Kenny? Well, I, clearly, I, you know, we listen to Mr Mandel. Uh, we appreciate the difficulties there, but I have to say I'm with Angus and would be deeply concerned about a, a mini-inquiry. Uh, it does appear to me that this is a deeply complex issue. We've understood both from Jamie McGregor and from David Stewart who have made the points, the complexities that arise, the difficulties even getting lawyers to understand this, the view that the Human Rights Commission has, has taken in terms of passing it elsewhere. It does seem to me that, A, the likelihood of us being able to write up a terms of reference uh, for a mini-inquiry would be extremely difficult. I think the complexity of it would make it challenging, and uh, I have a background in law, but would be very challenged by this, never minding having little knowledge, if any, on rural affairs and agriculture and the specifics relating to, to uh, uh, milk. So I think the uh, challenges for the committee in carrying out inquiry would be significant, and it really is a situation where, whilst I've got the greatest of sympathy for people who clearly have suffered it really is uh, for others to pursue through other channels. We have, uh, as in others, come to the end of the road. Jackson? It strikes me that what Mr MacDonald is asking us to do is to hang Mr and Mr. Mrs Mandel out to dry and all those others who similarly suffered. Their recourse, it would appear, is the law. Uh, and yet we understand that the law or at least human rights lawyers, are not interested in pursuing the matter. Uh, and insofar as anybody has even been identified who might have been entertained the idea, not at a cost that anybody would judge reasonable. Yes, the issues are complex. I can't believe they're any more complex than the inquiry we held into child sex exploitation, however, which seemed to me to be as complex as any. I don't know whether Mr McCaskill is right. He may well be. But I'm reluctant not to at least allow Parliament to demonstrate its ability to be fearless in the pursuit of what is, after all, the convenience of the Scottish Government's opinion of its own conduct as being a reason why this petition should be closed. And I don't think that simply in the face of that opinion, a committee of the Scottish Parliament should surrender any further investigation of the matter. And therefore, I would be interested in seeking to establish whether the proposal 
that Mr Stewart has made is one that is feasible. And if so, then I think it is a matter in which Parliament should be prepared to act and consider further. John Mawson. You know, uh, Mr Stewart's suggestion of a, a mini-inquiry, and he's well-versed in the, the workings of this committee, being the former convener. The difficulty I have in terms of a mini-inquiry being conducted by this committee is that when we took on the child sexual exploitation uh, inquiry, that was over a period of time. We actually went into that in some detail. And it's the definition of what a mini-inquiry would be. Now, Angus MacDonald made the suggestion, one, the first suggestion was that he didn't think it could go any further, uh, and therefore you know, his initial assessment was that we close the petition. But then he indicated, and as per the recommendations in the committee papers, that we'd possibly refer this petition on to the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. And I would be keen, and I don't want to close the petition, but I'd be keen if we transferred or the put it over to the Iraqi committee to actually deal with this issue because they are dealing with and had a debate recently in Parliament on the dairy quota issues and I think this uh, petition is part of that wider debate and has to be seen in the context of that wider debate and I think if, the, the, if an appropriate committee and given the, uh, the Rural Affairs Committee is already carrying out that work then I think it would be appropriate for us as a committee to refer the petition over to uh, the Rural Affairs Committee for consideration as part of their wider investigation into the milk quotas uh, issue. And that way, hopefully, we, that committee can take on the wider issues in terms of an inquiry with the knowledge and experience that that committee has in terms of rural, rural affairs. David? And I'm quite happy to support John and Angus' um, recommendations here that it's put to the Rural Affairs Committee. Okay. Initially, I had uh, given thought that we may invite the Minister back, but I think there could very well be a, a, an opportunity. I think, with regards to a mini inquiry, I think that perhaps would lie more with the Rural Affairs Committee, and I would tend to perhaps, well, I definitely would support if this were referred to the Rural Affairs Committee uh, for their consideration. Uh, is there any other points that we may want to raise, or are we quite happy with that action that's been proposed? Jackson? I formally oppose that, convener. As I understand it, there is no investigation by the Rural Affairs Committee at the moment, and this is simply to consider the petition in the context of any future work it may undertake in the dairy industry. I don't think that advances the petition or the petitioner's uh, difficulties in any way at all. So, uh, unusually, on this occasion, if that is the recommendation, I will wish to formally oppose it. Before we move to, to either for or against, uh, you know, public clarity for myself, but if you, were, if you were referring it to the Rural Affairs Committee, would it be on the... Could we also maybe add to that that, you know, there has been a, a call for a mini uh, inquiry into this? Uh, does that make any difference? for me if you were assuring me that either ourselves or they would carry that out however if you're not in that position then it wouldn't make any difference for me I'm looking at citizens coming to us for support and help we have to find a way of doing that if we can what we can't do is allow the government to rough shot over citizens who can't afford to stand up to them it's just, just, we just can't do that we live in a democracy, for God's sake. We're supposed to be looking after our people, and we, sh we should shy away from that. Yeah. With regards to giving an assurance, I don't think I'm in a position to, to, to give any assurance, but the, there has been... Uh, John Wilson, you want to come in first? Convener, I was going to say, given Jackson Carlaw's comments about the uncertainty whether the Rural Affairs Committee are going to uh, conduct any further work on the dairy quotas issue, then rather than referring the petition on, because once we refer a petition on, it then goes out of our hands, it goes over to that committee. Uh, could I suggest, and I'm not sure how this suggestion will be taken, convener, but could I suggest that we ask the clerks to speak to the Rural Affairs Committee clerks to find out if there is anything in the work programme of the Rural Affairs Committee which could cover the petition being raised 
Uh, and if not, then we reconsider as a committee how we take this petition forward. Okay. Do we then? I'm sorry. I, I, I'd be comfortable with an approach, you know, through Clarks or directly without, you know, taking John Wilson's point of formally referring it. Equally, if the Rural Affairs Committee were not to be considering a mini inquiry, I think I would want to know why, because I do think that they are better placed with greater expertise than we are. So it might be rather than to take a decision to you know, close the petition or indeed to formally refer it, we could perhaps <coughs> make informally or formally informally a request to the uh, Rural Affairs Committee uh, as to whether they are prepared to carry out a mini inquiry, uh, what their views are, and if not, why not, and then I think I might be in a better position to take uh, a judgment as to where I think I might be feel competent or capable of going. Can we then agree that, that I will write formally to the Rural Affairs Committee uh, with the points that have been raised in regards to the thing, and then we'll wait. I'll write formally to the convener, and we'll see what the response is, and then we can move forward later. Dave yeah. Stewart. Um, thank you. Could I just to put in my thanks to the committee for listening to Jimmy Rigger and myself and for the understanding that the committee members have had on this particular issue. Thank you. We agreed then with action that's agreed. been agreed. Right. Thank you very much, young colleagues. The final continued petition is PE. 1552 by Peter Campbell on the choice of treatment for cancer patients. Members have a note by the clerk and the uh, and submissions. Can I now invite contributions from members? I don't think we can take it any further. We've uh, highlighted the case. It might be that we can provide some, you know, signposting petitioner, but it does seem to me that this is really quite a complex position. They take a view that's not <laughs> orthodox, if I could put it that way, and that is not necessarily a bad thing, but given the, uh, the bureaucracy that we need to have for medical treatments, uh, it does seem to me that I think there's little further we can take other than you know provide some information to him as to where he may be capable of taking it further. Do you agree then, colleagues, to close the petition? Close. Thank you. Uh, the committee will now go into private session for item four on today's agenda.